Okay, so we're here with Senator Jose Rodriguez, and he's um, been listening to all of this research about English language learners and um, what school funding has has been taking place over the last three years, and what that seems to what difference that seems to make. So, what's your reaction to this? And What's important about this? Well, let me say, first of all, I want to congratulate IDRA for sponsoring this uh, conference. I think it's very, very important for the future of education in this state, especially for our Latino students. And I think what we heard from the research is confirmation, confirmation that Texas is not doing right by our English language learners. Uh, we're not adequately funding the programs. We're not providing even the adequate base funding uh, we just heard for, for the English language learner students, which of course applies across the board. Uh, and so I think that this data will be very useful in this current session. Certainly will be useful for me uh, in terms of the work of the Senate Education Committee that, I, that I'm now serving to, to propose uh, better funding and better additional base funding, as well as more uh, emphasis on the bilingual and dual language programs that are necessary to ensure that our Latino students, mainly the English language learner students, uh, can excel in school. And, and, and as we also heard uh, confirmation of what we have been hearing for quite some time from our state demographer, former state demographer, Steve Murdoch, that Texas needs to do better in investing in education for the Latino students who are projected to be the future labor force of this state. That's why it's important. That's why it's extremely important. I think if Texas wants to compete, if it wants to stay ahead in the 21st century economy, uh, then Texas and indeed the whole nation need to uh, do a lot more for our English language learners and our students and the programs that they have to go through, the teacher preparation, more teachers that are certified, that are, that are qualified to teach our students so that we can have a labor force that is going to be trained and educated to meet the needs of the state. Okay, and we're here with uh, Dr. Julian vasquez Gillick. Um, who was one of the panelists earlier this morning on this conversation, and I, by the way, did tweet out that link to your blog post so that people can people can find it. Um, tell me, tell me what um, what you've learned here today. Sure, I think one of the most this is a very important issue for the state of Texas and the Americans in general. One fifth, almost one fifth of all students in the state of Texas are what are called English language learners. So that, that's a key piece. Nearly uh, 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 millions of, of kids across the United States fall into this category of students who are learning the English language. So um, that's, I think, the, 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 the important context of the conversation. The second thing is, is that the question is, are we properly funding schools to benefit these kids, these students. Because we know that English language learners are considered a special population. In Texas, they have an additional weight to the per pupil monies that are allotted uh, to schools. And the question is, is that weight enough? Unfortunately, Texas has a sort of sordid history when it comes to school finance. They've been in court five times over the last couple of decades in terms of uh, funding students. They have a con the legislature has a constitutional obligation to provide an adequate education. And the courts have said five times or four times that they aren't doing so. And English language learners are, the, when you disaggregate the group, are the group that un uh, underperforms across the board in terms of student outcomes, dropout rates, grade retention rates, test scores. And so are we providing schools with the resources necessary to adequately serve it. And so this conference get, provided the opportunity, A, to look at the data, uh, to look at the school finance data, B, what are some of the best practices, uh, educators talked about them, we talked about empirically based uh, uh, best practices for English language learners. So what should come from this? I think that folks uh, would, will, will be uh, interested to know the data about school finance so that the legislature will act. 
we clearly there's higher ways for the various special education categories. Some districts are spending 10, 20 percent more on educating ELLs beyond what the state is allotting to them because this is a population that needs high quality teachers, needs resources, needs community liaisons with the community. There's a variety of things that we need to provide uh, these students for them to be successful. And money does matter, especially for English language learners. And ultimately, what is the importance of making sure that English language learners are helped in, in sure. when they're students? What's sure, well, the ultimate importance? Well, we're a nation of immigrants. A uh, hundred years ago, it was the Germans, it was the Italians, uh, and, and now the waves of immigration are coming from Latin America, Central America, Mexico, and other places. This is our future. This is the, we're talking here about the vibrance of our democracy a decade from now, two decades from now. So we must provide these children an opportunity, an equal opportunity, to live out their American dream. I think honestly there's, there's a great deal both of interest but, but clearly some concern about where we are as it relates to providing quality programs, especially for secondary level students. Uh, based on the comments I've heard, there's clearly an understanding that we are not where we want to be, certainly in the areas of teacher preparation, or curriculum, or materials. Uh, providing support to help uh, school districts both identify but also retain teachers that are needed in this area. And clearly that if we don't do a more effective job, that there are going to be some serious economic consequences uh, if we don't offer. And that's, that, that gets to the other part of it, why this is important. I mean, what, what's the, the global sort of significance of, of this? Clearly, uh, uh, based on, on the data that, that we saw today, too many of our EL students are not uh, achieving at levels required by the state uh, to meet state graduation requirements. Uh, and if many of them don't get through our high schools, they're going to drop out. We don't base just on, on extensive research that's been done on the impact of level of education on uh, not only uh, earning power, but there are related studies that uh, suggest that uh, people that are better educated have better health uh, situations. They can, uh, people that are better educated uh, have uh, uh, higher uh, levels of, of taxes that they pay out. Uh, so uh, benefits in multiple areas. The downside is if you don't have an educated workforce as, as a business person, then you have to invest greater resources just retrain your workers. Uh, and bottom line is if you don't invest up front, then there are the negative uh, costs associated in, in terms of uh, income transfer programs, uh, health you know, uh, care benefit needs, and, and also just uh, job training uh, uh, implications that will be required if we don't do a good job. So, so it has some far-reaching, very far-reaching implications. Far-reaching, uh, you know, we, we have to get beyond the notion that, well, if, if, if we don't do well, you know, it's just this one individual and the problem will be gone next year or in a couple of years. No, it's, it's an issue that our failures stay with us for a lifetime. And um, what people are talking about at the tables right now are what 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 are the next steps? What are the next steps? Yeah. Given what mm -hmm. the research has said about not only the characteristics of schools that are successful, uh, but the, you know, what we found about you know, funding levels are required. What are the kinds of changes that we need to start making in schools uh, in terms of, of, of how we identify the students? What kinds of, of, of instructional programs we provide for them? how we support our teachers, how we make sure that uh, we don't uh, use data around uh, tests. You know, assessment is important. Uh, we understand that there's concerns about too much testing. At the same time, if we don't have some measure, then how do we know how our kids are doing? Uh, they're they're going to talk about, well, what is next? Uh, not only in Texas, but Texas is looked upon in other parts of the country for uh, new ways of addressing these kinds of issues and we hope to provide some of those answers to them. Right. All right, well, um, also, we have a robust online audience and um, I've been telling them, and go ahead, please repeat to them, that their ideas about these things are welcome. 
Yes, of course. You know, uh, we are you know uh, physically around uh, these tables. We understand that there is a vast amount of expertise out in in the field. Uh, you know, those of you that are, are joining us online, uh, we would not only welcome, we would really seriously ask that you share your insights, your perspective, your expertise, so that we can share them as we put the proceedings together for a wider distribution. So even beyond today? Beyond today, there will be right. an, ongoing, an ongoing both conversation and dissemination. Wonderful. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Today I've learned that the importance of um, making resources and funding um, equitable for English language learners and the importance of that, why? Because um, we need to make sure that they're getting the equitable services um, instructionally and academically in the classroom. You're going to be taking some of this back with you? Yes, I will be taking because some of this. Because you're the head of yes. bilingual services? <laughs> yes, yes. Right? right. Um, why is all of this important? Um, it's important because I think it's important that for everyone to um, understand that our English language learners are students first most, but also because it's important to look at their linguistic needs and academic needs individually and then determine how to plan for them appropriately so that they're able to get the services they need. And um, Highlanddale has one of the highest um, percentages, if I recall correctly, in the San Antonio area of people who are um, English language learners. I don't know we're the highest, but we have quite a few. We have about 2,500 students right. in our district, okay. and so, so what happens if, if um, what happens if we don't address this, this issue right now? I think it, the, the, it, it's important for our students. Um, if we don't address the issue, I don't think the students will get the uh, support and services that they need. And then what? And then there, there, there'll be a huge gap. You know, well, it's already a gap, but even the gap will just continue to grow. Um, and the students are will not be able to just have the same opportunities that everyone else has. And that is a, a, a cost to the rest of society as well. Yes, and so that, that also will, will have a huge impact actually because because we're such a large population of our ELLs, um, it will have a bigger impact on what our future is and our future of our kids. Mm -hmm. So there's a pretty good um, um, audience online out there um, watching watching us right now, um, I, and um, some many of them it sounds like are educators and, and people who are pretty passionate about this as well. Um, uh, feel free to let them know um, that, that you're interested um, in, in hearing what they have to say. Well, I appreciate you taking time to listen even just to today's segment, but also just to um, continue to support students and continue to fight for students and, of course, reach out to me in any way that I can help support as well. Thanks. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Linda, um, you're with Our Lady of Lake University, and you've been um, uh, partnering with, with IDRA on this? Yes, I'm a tenured faculty member here at Our Lady of the Lake. I'm the coordinator of bilingual education. And so Our Lady of the Lake was one of the first bilingual education, or was the first bilingual education program that was certifying teachers in the state. Um, and so we're going, we had a 40th anniversary a couple years ago, and a lot of people from IDRA were here. I know Albert Cortez and Abelardo Villarreal were all graduates of Our Lady of the Lake. And so a lot of the leaders in bilingual education have come out of this program. Um, it's very exciting when you talk about bilingual education, although it's very difficult um, to train teachers in bilingual education because of a lack of resources, not only at the K-12 level, but also at the um, university level. And so here at Our Lady of the Lake, um, recently what we did was we even took like linguistic classes that were offered only to bilingual educators, and now we're offering them to all students. But as I sat here today and listening to um, the gentleman from the Civil Rights Office speaking, he was talking about the training that we do in terms of ESL students. And I thought to myself, we're offering these courses, but we only offer them for bilingual educators. So we're sure that the bilingual educators are receiving training and learning strategies and English language learners, but then I thought to myself, not all mainstream teachers are doing that. So I think that coming away from this meeting today, I'm going to go back up with the education faculty and start talking about that although we have pieces of it in there, we have actual classes in the bilingual education program that focus specifically all semester on working on cognitive academic language learning strategies.
And that's important for people who are teaching all sorts of subjects. Yes, all subject areas, um, because of the amount and the increasing number of ELLs in our communities, right. especially here in San Antonio. And so there is a very high likelihood that they're going to they're going to come in contact with kids who are ELL. Absolutely. So they need to at least have. Yes, a um, bit of a hand up. Yes, and we are looking to train more bilingual teachers. I mean, we have a lot of spaces available from districts that call all the time stating that we're not training enough bilingual educators. And so every student that has come out of Our Lady of the Lake in our program can receive jobs right out of the gate. Okay. As soon as they take their test, we have a 98% pass rate for our test. 76% of our teachers after five years are still in the classroom teaching. And so we're doing a really good job. We just don't have enough of them. At the national level for the National Association of Bilingual Education coming up in March, the Bessel organization, which is our bilingual educator student organization, is going to be discussing a along with UTSA, the pipeline and how we are not training enough teachers in bilingual education and ESL education that they're not coming into the field. And so without them coming into the field, we have more alternative certification teachers in the classrooms, which aren't always trained at the highest levels. And we also have a lot of permanent subs in classrooms because we just aren't producing enough teachers. So, so say you could talk to a kid in high school who's getting ready to come to, you know, get, getting ready to think about college and careers and stuff like that. What do you say to the kid that says they really should focus on not just being a teacher but being a bilingual, bilingual teacher? teacher? How do you, what, what, do you, what do you tell them? So what's in it for them? What's in it for them? The joy of teaching, because we know we're not here to make the big bucks. Um, as um, part of Our Lady of the Lake and being from the Sisters of Divine Providence, we call teaching a calling. We're like, it's not really so much a profession as it is a calling, because we don't want teachers in the classroom who don't want to be there, who are not happy, or who don't understand going above and beyond to work with ESL learners or to work with children who come from a second language. We have so many um, new immigrants into the community, especially from Catholic Charities, how they've been bringing a lot of children over. So we have schools that we have adjunct professors teaching at who are principals, and they have kids from 60, 60 different language communities in their classes, and yet we're not training the teachers fast enough to work with them. So when we talk about bilingual education, we're not only talking Spanish-English anymore, although that is huge for South Texas, we're starting to train for all languages. And so when I prepare teachers here, they'll ask me, why are we studying Hungarian? Or why are we studying Devonji? Or why are we studying Tagalog? And I say, because you never know who you're going to get in your bilingual class. And it's not enough to know phonemic awareness and morphology and orthography. For the English and Spanish language only, you have to understand it and be able to research and find this material in other languages. And so that's been a huge push as well um, that we're working on. But yes, anyone who would like to become a bilingual educator, I say come to Our Lady of the Lake and come to our program and look at it and see. We've got small numbers in our classroom. I teach maybe 12 to 15 per class. Um, sometimes they're as low as 10 kids in the classroom. Um, but we're very hands-on and we're training leaders. You know, we're out at national conferences, we're at state conferences. My students are presenting. I try to kind of stand back and just build leaders and let them do the work. Well, I think it's been a very educa educational experience, particularly I think that it has been where you bring people who are on the ground teaching students that are English uh, learners and uh, people from uh, colleges and universities, research community, policy makers and so forth, so that that exchange and finding out where uh, people are coming from uh, has been very uh, informative. Now, right next, right next to you is another college, the College of Education at UTSA, yep. and, and you are also dealing with the, the pipeline of people who are bilingual educators yep. right next door, right? Yep. So yep. this is this is of, of a broader importance. Oh, yeah. So not only do you have the bilingual uh, pipeline, but you also have the school-to-prison pipeline since uh, college, uh, Department of Criminal Justice is, exactly. in, is in our exactly. college, and we've seen a significant uh, increase of kids going to... Uh, detention starts with detention and so forth and uh, all of a sudden then you have uh, uh, people being expelled from school and so forth and now all of a sudden you have the 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 kind of the road into the uh, juvenile justice system and so forth uh, so that's a, a major part and particularly because you have students who are poor for example from economically disadvantaged backgrounds 
uh, students who are English learners and so forth are the ones that are more likely to get into trouble with the uh, criminal justice system. So, so those are the ramifications of doing nothing. Right, right? exactly. And, yeah, and yeah. Um, what, is, what is the upside of doing something? Oh, the upside is, uh, I think, that a small investment in terms of the education of kids and improving the academic uh, uh, preparation of uh, kids who don't speak English fluently and so forth, getting them ahead and so forth, getting them uh, to finish school, getting them to go to community colleges, to four-year institutions, have careers and so forth, that they become taxpayers uh, and so forth, they contribute back to the community and these are individuals who are more likely to be civically engaged and so forth and participate in the larger society compared to kids who all of a sudden are uh, are marginalized and kept from uh, from these kinds of opportunities. That's the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely the future. Yeah. And, and and events like this, I mean, what what IDRA has pulled together today? Tell me, tell me about what the, yeah. the significance of that is. Yeah. Well, IDRA has always been a, a major leader, not only here in San Antonio but nationally in terms of uh, the work that they do and pulling the research in and that intersection, I think, between the academics and the practitioners is very important, and the policy makers. So they bring all these three together, and you can see it here in this event today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And there is a, a robust audience online. Oh, very yeah. robust uh -huh. audience yeah. online from, yeah, I got, uh, from Rhode Island to, to, um, to uh, the Rio Grande Valley. Yeah, and I got an email West. from somebody from Alabama a oh, little while ago. Oh, say hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's terrific. Uh -huh. It's terrific, and and we're asking them to contribute their ideas as well uh -huh. because it's so important. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. I uh, learn a lot. Uh, there are people all around us, all around me, um, in my place of work at IDRA and in schools and in communities, uh, with parent groups. And uh, if we listen a little bit, we learn a lot. Um, today, of course, we're talking about English language learners, which are almost one out of five students in the state of Texas. These are students that are learning English. Um, and that, unfortunately, are not being well served by schools in Texas. And so we are taking a look at what needs to be done to assure that uh, they're prepared for college. Right now, for example, only one out of ten English language learners is uh, prepared to go to college. That's outrageous. Uh, when we know that college is needed um, for almost 70% uh, of the new jobs. So we're taking a look at that, taking a look at how we make sure that teachers are well prepared to um, teach students who uh, are learning another language and need to be able to keep learning in their own language while they learn English. So that's what we are up to. Uh, parents tell us, importantly, that they want their kids to learn English, they want their kids to succeed, they want their kids to maintain their own language so that they can keep their familial connections, and they want them to succeed and do well. So the people who are gathered in the room today that include students and um, teachers and school administrators, superintendents, university people, all are gathered to find uh, solutions to what are persistent problems. We know that, among other things, we need to make sure of two things, very importantly. One is that we put our money where our mouth is, that there is more money that is needed to assure that English language learners have high quality education. Uh, it is unfair and not right that they are relegated to the poorest schools. Um, secondly, we also know that we have to make sure that teachers uh, know how to educate students who are learning another language. So teacher training is one other thing that we've been talking about today and that is crucial. And then also making sure that we're putting something in place that measures that, that, that we're improving, right? That's right, but, that's right. But with some caveats that you That's talked about. right. So we need to know how we're doing. You know, if... Um, if you or I want to lose weight, we need to know how much we weigh, have we lost anything, and are our efforts producing results. I think in much the same way, we rely on certain measures to know if what we're doing for children is producing the result that we want, which is learning and preparation. 
What we don't want to do is to hurt students by testing them and then saying, well, you know what, you didn't pass that test, so now we're going to have to hold you behind. There's plenty of evidence that says that high-stakes testing, which means making big decisions for children on the basis of a test score, is just plain wrong. And so that is not what we need. But what we do need is to be able to do maybe sample testing, just like we do with the water in a river, to know that it's, you know, high quality. We test a few drops and we say, oh yeah, this is working. This is what we need in the state of Texas. And the people who are here are taking a look at that. Senator Jose Rodriguez, who is here, has also committed to working to increase the amount of dollars that are available to English language learner um, students in schools for high quality teaching, for good curriculum. We heard that materials are just not available in the school. So that's another important thing. And so I think together we can get this done. And, and um, what, is, what is at stake? I think at stake is the future, certainly, of the students who are being relegated to second-class citizenship. But perhaps, from the perspective of all of us, what is at stake is our common um, survival, our uh, common ground. Education is the key in terms of economic prosperity. Uh, IDRA just did a paper together with UTSA and the San Antonio Hispanic uh, Chamber, and we found out that education is the key economic strategy so that all of us have good neighborhoods, have neighborhoods in which we can raise our families and in which our kids can thrive, have good jobs. So that is what is at stake. That's very, very cool. And um, I, I have to tell you that, that even during you know Saturday night's gala by the Hispanic Chamber, yes. they talked about that white paper Wonderful. and how important that is yes. for the future of the city. Yes, and I think really that the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber, among all of the chambers in Texas, is really taking a lead role to get this message across. They've been working with city council and with superintendents locally to make sure that local school districts get on board and say, you know, we are going to prepare every student to go on to college. They may not all go to college, they may not all want to go to college, but they will have a choice instead of being ill-prepared and therefore unable to have that choice. And that's also because it's not just an issue for academics, it's not just an issue for, for teachers, it's also an issue for business people. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. For the workforce, entrepreneurship, um, yeah, it's, it's about all of us living uh, a good and decent and common life in which all of us are productive and can contribute our best. Yeah, I have to. I have to share one story with you. When I was when I was named business editor at the Express News, I um, w went and immediately Tom Frost said, senior said he wanted to speak with me, and he said, "Okay, so what is a what is a business story?" And I said, "Education's a business story." That's right. That's exactly right. It is the business story, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and I think um, more and more of the business community is finding that out, and I find the business community really um, willing to do their share to uh, to make sure that all of these issues are addressed and that we address education once and for all. There's no reason why we can't, by the way. We have everything that it takes. We have the knowledge, we have the commitment, we have the entrepreneurship that would be required to create the solutions that are needed. Um, and I think it's time. Um, Maldef's been involved in this issue for a long, long time. And you've been involved in this issue for a long, long time, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think it's uh, 35, 40 years and counting uh, that Maldiv has been involved in this battle. Uh, me, a little bit less than that. What What's new for you here today? Uh, I mean, what's new is is to realize exactly how few successful secondary programs there are for English learners. Because you hear a lot of rhetoric about, oh, well, you know, this school here is doing excellent for English learners, they have a great superintendent, they have a great plan, but yet when you dig into the data and you realize, wait, there are so few successful schools, and that's just, you know, uh, using the limited definition of success based on, you know, standardized testing and those uh, results, but I think it's a real challenge you know, for us still uh, politically, as far as we've come, we still have so much 
further to go, especially for secondary yield students. Wow. And so, yes, this, this, we, they, we heard earlier today about political solutions or, or, or you know, the political process, and you're also involved in a couple of, still involved, right, in a couple of lawsuits about this. Yeah, whether it's, a, whether it's a lawsuit about the funding for uh, English learners or it's a lawsuit about the uh, lack of educational opportunities in the classroom for English learners, you know, Texas has far better policy on paper for English learners uh, than many other states. But when it comes to funding policy that is so divorced from the actual resources those students need to succeed, and when it comes to monitoring and implementing the programmatic policies that we have on paper, that's practically non-existent. And it's essentially set up so that the state can do the least amount of monitoring and intervention uh, to support school districts that are already strapped for resources. What are the consequences? Well, I mean, if you're talking about the individual student, it means that student never reaches his or her full potential. And that's just the wrong thing that we should be doing for any child in Texas. Uh, if you're talking about for the family, then it's, of course it's going to be lack of support. If you're talking about the community, uh, then you have people who are, aren't going to be staying in uh, certain communities. You have uh, state and national economic uh, consequences, whether it's dealing with uh, pay, uh, whether it's dealing with professions, filling certain professions as we move to a more advanced uh, technological world, or uh, if you're looking at health and housing and criminal uh, justice system, I mean, all of these is, are going to be impacted if we fail to educate students and fail to deliver the educational opportunities they need to succeed. So where, where do we have to go from here? I mean, what's, what's, like, what are we, the next steps? You're talking next steps at your table? Y yeah, Everyone absolutely. Is? And I think, you know, the real, re re the real progress that we need now is, one, to ensure that, you know, certain policies are changed so that we can build a better, bigger and better pipeline of uh, qualified teachers for English learner students. I think that we need to look at our policies regarding uh, testing and what that testing is and how we're diverting so much of the resources to testing companies as opposed to you know the students who actually need it in the classroom. Uh, it just has to be a comprehensive solution that has a marriage between education policy and the research that shows what can work. I, I, absolutely that's what has really been missing largely over the years since you know the the great battles won in the early 1980s, uh, but now here we are, you know, in a new era, and we need to push and progress uh, the movement. Thank right. you so much. Thank for you. The time. I really All right. It. Thank you.